Have you ever wondered how hackers think? If this keeps you up at night, you have come to the right place. Hey guys, Notch Kazi here. Welcome back. In today's video, I'm going to do a deep dive in security. So you get to learn how hackers think. What are the internal mechanics in their head that they use to break into networks? We're going to look at things like social engineering, the type of psychological warfare that's happening out there that is taking over the world by storm. Things like ransomware, big, massive companies in the US and around the globe have been hit by ransomware. And viruses have been around a long time. Things like worm, things like phishing attacks, we're going to get into a lot of these different topics and I will then talk you through the different strategies that we can employ to make ourselves and our networks secure. We'll talk through things like designing and developing a security policy. We'll talk about things like biometric security. We'll talk through different type of authentication mechanisms that you can implement to make your network highly secure and to employ a stronger security posture throughout your organization. So at the end of the day, your company and your employees are well protected. So if you're ready, I am beyond pumped. Let's roll. Welcome to CCNA 200-301 course. Today, I'm going to cover Section 5, Part 2 of the CCNA exam, Security Fundamentals. Today's video is dedicated to doing a deep dive in security. This is going to be one of the most exciting videos, I promise you. Let's go. Here are the topics I plan on covering today. First, Network Security Overview. Second, Common Security Threats. Third, security defense techniques. Fourth, AAA. Fifth, security features. And finally, I'll wrap it up with security devices. Now, before I get into any of the topics, the first thing I want to cover today is a couple of studies and stats by National Cybersecurity Alliance plus Gartner and ISC2 workforce study in 2019. Cybercrime damage estimated to hit $6 trillion by 2021. Every 39 seconds, there is a hacker attack. 95% of cybersecurity breaches happen due to human error. 25 billion devices connected to the internet. That's the internet of things or IOT explosion that we're experiencing right now. And in 2018, hackers stole half a billion personal records. Now at this point, you might be saying, okay, Naj, stop it. We get it. We see the trend. It's very depressing. Do you have any good news to share or are you going to keep hitting us with all this negative stuff? And my answer is, I'm not sharing these stats to scare you or to make you feel depressed. On the contrary, I wanted to demonstrate the fact that we have so many problems, but with every problem, there's an opportunity. Currently, there are over 4 million jobs available in the cybersecurity realm that are unfulfilled. So there's tremendous opportunity for you to go out there and crush it. Now let's shift our attention to network security overview. Let's say you just started a brand new business. You got three employees, Bob, Jen, and Dan, and they need access to a certain server. So let's say this is an accounting server that they need access to, to update records and maybe sell coffee, manage inventory, things of that nature. Now. This is what we call an enterprise closed system. As you can clearly see, this network is not connected to anything outside. It's a completely closed system 
because you have internal employees talking to an internal server connected to an internal switch. And this is what we call a perfect security. And the idea here is that if you're not connected to the outside world, you're perfectly secure. To take this concept even further, if you want an absolute perfect security, completely disconnect all of your devices from the internet. Disconnect your computer from Wi-Fi or wired connection, whatever have you, that will give you the most perfect security that's out there. But you see a problem with that? The problem is it is perfect security, but you don't have access to anything. And that's the delicate dance that we're gonna talk about between security and availability. You want the ability to be able to connect to the outside world. You want to be able to access things while maintaining security in your environment. How do we do that? That's what today's session is all about. Now, let's take the previous network to the next level. Let's add more complexity to our network. We still have Bob, Jen, and Dan, but now things are getting to the next level. We have our server move into a DMZ segment. We also have an extranet segment to connect to our extranet business partners. So for example, to fulfill coffee orders and things like that, instead of having to call those people, we may just have a network connection into our partners so we can place orders and transact business over that extra net. And we may also have a wide area network connection to be able to connect to the internet. And that may include connecting to certain web servers and things of that nature. Now, this is a very different environment compared to the previous picture we were looking at where we weren't connected to anything outside. Here, we're connecting to a lot of outside networks and out on the internet, we may have bad guys. On the extranet within the business partner network, you never know. Maybe they have a disgruntled employee who's not too happy with the business and they might want to hack anybody that's connected to that extra net network. And you never know. Someone in your own internal network, let's say Bob, could be a gray hat guy where he's a good guy during the day, but maybe a bad guy at night. So what you may want to do is you don't want to assume that it's okay to allow people access to everything that are on the trusted side of your network, which in this case would be the local area network. The LAN would be considered the trusted side of the network, right? You want to make sure you're scrutinizing the LAN, the DMZ, which, is, which stands for Demilitarized Zone, the WAN, Wide Area Network, and the Extranet. And this is what's called an attack surface. Now, we're going beyond CCNA here, but I think it's important for you to understand as we start talking security as a, as a larger, more comprehensive topic is the fact that this router has four different interfaces and that represents an attack surface. We can have an attack from a wide area network. We can have our extranet partner attack us. We can have one of our employees launch an attack. And even the DMZ segment is not fully protected depending on how we have our access control lists set up and the firewall policies and things like that. There may be some gaps that bad people or bad actors can take advantage of to be able to steal information and steal credentials and wreak havoc in our environment. Here's some terminology you wanna familiarize yourself with when it comes to security. The term vulnerability. It's a weakness or a flaw in the network or a system. An example could be a bad piece of code embedded within an operating system. So for example, your iPhone, it gets an update every couple of days or Android or Microsoft Windows or Mac, you name it. Any operating system that's out there, you'll constantly see these patches being released because there's always some vulnerabilities embedded within a code. And if you look at something like Windows or Mac, those OSs have potentially millions of lines of code. And it's very easy for a software developer to make a mistake. It may be an honest mistake, 
but it could end up causing your business a lot of money. So that's a vulnerability. That mistake, that weakness, that flaw represents an attack surface that a bad actor can take advantage of to get into your network. The other term you want to think about and know and be familiar with is exploit. A tool used to target vulnerability in order to gain control of the network or system. An example could be a hacking app like a key logger designed to steal information. A lot of key loggers, what people do is they put them on a thumb drive, on a USB thumb drive, and then they may go ahead and plug that USB thumb drive in your PC or your Mac. And the next thing you know is every single key that you're typing in on your keyboard is not being captured. And this way they can steal information. So for example, if you went to bankofamerica.com, what follows is most likely your username and password. They can figure that out. So as you can imagine, that's bad. And, and that's what an exploit is. It's a tool. The next term you want to be familiar with is threat. It's an intent or action that leads to a disruption of it or a destruction of a system or an asset. Who performs this action? This action is performed by a threat actor or a hacker. An example is a hacker exploiting a vulnerability to steal credentials. So we talked about exploit, that's a tool. We talked about vulnerability, that's a weakness. A hacker can take advantage of a weakness in our system and use a hacking tool to steal credentials, which could be keylogger. And the final term I want you to be familiar with is risk. The potential for loss, damage, or destruction of a system or network as a result of a threat exploiting a vulnerability. So this builds on all the different terms that we have learned so far and connects them together in a connective tissue. An example could be a revenue generating website being unavailable to customers. So that's a risk. So let's say amazon.com, one of the most popular websites in the world for placing orders. Can you imagine amazon.com being unavailable because somebody hacked or attacked amazon.com? that would be absolutely terrible because that would mean potentially tens of millions of dollars worth of loss just maybe in a matter of hours. So what we need to do is evaluate risk. And, and based on that risk profile, we want to figure out how to protect our network. Now that we have looked at the terminology, now let's shift our attention to common security threats. But before we do though, I wanna bring something to your attention. There was a really nice piece on CBS News on 60 Minutes that you can search on YouTube, it's available for free, on ransomware. And they talked about how cyber criminals hold data hostage and why the best solution is often paying a ransom. I mean, that's insane. They're actually suggesting that you should go ahead and pay the bad guys. And check this out, guys, if I continue reading this. Targets have included hospitals and municipalities, but the FBI says anyone on the internet should expect to be attacked by cyber criminals. That's one of the government agencies admitting that we are all vulnerable. Another piece of article I wanna share with you guys by New York Times. Colonial Pipeline is a company on the East Coast. They are the operator of fuel lines. They were actually hit by a ransomware attack and they ended up paying $5 million to be able to get their data back. And we'll talk about how those attacks happen and some of the mechanics behind them momentarily. But check this out. The payment clears the way for gas to begin flowing again but it risks emboldening other criminal groups to take American companies hostage by seizing control of their computers. So in other words, this type of attack allows the bad guys globally to get inspired and pay more attention to developing more advanced type of ransomwares because it, this was a successful attack. They were actually paid to allow colonial pipeline to get their data back. So that is very serious. And as a matter of fact, they had FBI involved. And I believe FBI informed colonial pipeline that the only way to get their data back is to actually pay the bad guys. There was no other way around it. 
So that is very serious, guys. So now that I have your attention, let's look at a couple of different type of attacks. So the first attack we're going to look at is called address spoofing attack. So in this attack, what we have is a hacker. And let's imagine we have a corporate server and we'll call that a target. And the hacker would construct an IP packet with a source IP of 200.21.199.250. Now, the IP in red in our IP packet, take a look at your screen. It's not available anywhere. It's some fictitious made up IP by the hacker. And there's a reason why it was crafted this way. You'll see it in a moment. And the destination IP is set to 199.1.9.24, which is our target machine. So that packet is sent to the target machine. And what does the target machine do? It sends an IP packet reply. So the source IP then becomes the corporate server IP but the destination IP is the source that the hacker had initially set, right? So basically this packet is going nowhere. It's going in no man's land. And why is this type of attack bad? Well, it's using up resources on this corporate server. Now this is one example and one packet. Imagine millions of packets or tens of millions of packets being sent to a corporate server, now that would be really, really bad. And once again, the idea is to just exhaust the system of its resources, CPU resources, memory resources. So that's the address spoofing attack. The other type of attack is called denial of service or DOS attack. Here, we have a bad guy, we have a target corporate server. In this case, what the bad guy does is crafts a TCP SYN message. So in a TCP three-way handshake, as you guys know, the first packet is TCP SYN. Once again, it sets the source IP to a fictitious IP that doesn't exist. Now the target server gets that message and it sends what's called a TCP SYN act. That's the second stage in our three-way handshake. And once again, that IP is going nowhere. That packet is going nowhere because it's a fictitious IP. That IP doesn't exist. But what it's doing on our server is that it's using up server TCP state table. So once again, CPU and memory resources on this server are being abused to the point that our state table gets full and we can no longer provide service to legitimate customers that might need access to this corporate server. And this is also called a TCP SYN flood attack because we're, we're flooding the corporate server with the TCP SYN messages. This is an ugly one. The next level up from the DOS attack is called distributor denial of service or DDoS attack. That's another very nasty one. Here we have a hacker who installs a CNC server or a command and control server. This is also called a botnet. And then we have a target machine, which once again is a corporate server. And what this bad guy does is scans the internet looking for machines that don't have security. So literally like they scan millions and millions of machines on the internet and people who don't have a firewall at home and have zero security at the edge of their network, bad guy goes ahead and controls those machines by infecting them and they turn into bots. And sometimes these bad guys can send some sort of like an email or some sort of embed a bot into a website. It can infect machines in different ways. But the ultimate result is that these machines turn into bots. And at that point, what the bad guy does is that instead of sending a single message to the target server, it now has all these bots that are part of a botnet and with a single command, all of these bots can send message and bombard the target server. I'm only showing five machines, but imagine 500 machines or 5,000 machines sending messages to a target machine. And you can also think of these bots as a zombie. That's another term that you will hear when you read articles and things like that. So keep that in in the back of your mind, it's like a zombie, an army of zombies, right? Attacking. 
humans or victims and it's also these are also called victims because these are innocent victims they have no idea that their machines are being used for nefarious purposes and the bad news is that if these attacks are really bad sometimes fbi or cia could actually be knocking on the door of these people that are running bots on their machines without even knowing without even realizing that they're causing this DDoS attack. So that's a really, really nasty one. Another type of attack is called reflection and amplification attack. Here, once again, we have a bad guy and we have a target machine and we have a reflector in the middle. So now what's happening is if you guys recall the spoofing attack, once again, the IP is spoofed. The source IP is not the hacker's IP, but the source IP is the target machine's IP. Now watch, it's a clever attack. So that packet initially is sent to the corporate server. Co corporate server then sends an IP packet reply to the machine that it's supposed to send the reply to, which happens to be the target. But remember, the original packet didn't come from the target, it came from the hacker. So the corporate server in the middle is once again an innocent victim who doesn't know what's going on, it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. It gets an IP packet, it sends an IP packet reply. But it's called a reflector attack because the guy in the middle becomes a reflector. Once again, the previous example that I was showing you of the DDoS attack, you can also think of this corporate server. Instead of a corporate server, imagine a bunch of bots in the middle acting as reflectors and then doing this on a massive scale. That's another really bad one. And now let's talk about man in the middle attack. That's a really interesting one and a pretty sophisticated type of attack. So to the left, we got a client. To the right, we got a server. In the middle, we got a default gateway. The guy on the left sends an ARP request saying, who has 172.16.1.254? Because our client is looking for that server IP. So it sends that message to the switch. Well, what does the switch do? If it doesn't have a MAC address already learned, it goes ahead and floods that packet out all ports. So every single port gets flooded except the port that it initially received the message on. That's how switches behave. And eventually that server will get that request and reply back saying, here is my MAC address. Ultimately, that's what we're trying to do, right? That's ARP, address resolution protocol. We have an IP address of the other machine, but we do not have a MAC. And in order to communicate on a local area network or a LAN, we need to be able to have a MAC address so we can craft our frames to be sent to the machine on our LAN. And this would be the normal traffic flow. Up until here, it's all good. It's all green. It's all kosher. There's nothing bad going on. But now let's talk through what happens in the case of man in the middle attack. So once again, the client sends an ARP request. Now what ends up happening is both the server and the bad guy gets the ARP request. But let's assume that the bad guy got the request before the server did. And the, what the bad guy is going to do, is going to send an ARP reply saying, hey, by the way, if you want to talk to the server, send that traffic to me. And it provides its own MAC address. Well, what ends up happening then is here's how the traffic flow looks like. Client sends data to the hacker and then the hacker modifies the data and forwards it over to the server. Now, Check this out, guys. It's a sophisticated attack because the guy in the middle is trying not to disrupt the service. He's trying to be, quote unquote, invisible through this transaction. He does not want to give the client or the server an impression that there's something malicious going on here. And client doesn't know because the client is completely clueless. Client thinks, hey, this is the way it's supposed to work. And the server doesn't know any better. The server also continues to forward traffic through the guy in the middle. And that's what the man in the middle attack is all about. And what this ultimately does is it creates a condition called ARP poisoning, where the ARP table 
on the client and the ARP table on the server gets poisoned because we have the wrong information in our ARP tables respectively and we are none the wiser. Now let's shift our attention to malware. The very first type of malware that I'm pretty sure you're most familiar with is called a virus. A malware designed to spread from one device to another and virus depends on the host to activate it very much like a human virus. Right? So for example, you may have the cold virus sitting in your throat, but until you provide certain conditions for that virus to activate, it will just sit there dormant until you activate it. Similarly, computer virus depends on the host to activate it. You as a host has to do something for that virus to be able to spread itself from one machine to another. The other type of malware is called worm. That's a nasty one. A worm is a standalone malware designed to self-replicate and propagate. It's activated independently on its own. Now the difference is, in contrast to a virus, a worm just completely independently activates itself without any human intervention. So it makes it very, very scary. The third type is a Trojan horse. So just like that city of Troy, Trojan Horse, if you have watched the movie Troy, I'm sure you know all about Trojan Horse. It's a malware disguised as a legitimate software. It could be used as a spyware for spying on the user, for example. And Trojan Horse must be installed by a user to activate. Once again, Trojan Horse acts very similar to a virus but it's disguised as a legitimate software. Okay, that's the difference. That's why they typically tell you that do not download random pieces of software on the internet because you might inadvertently download a Trojan horse that might be a spyware running on your machine. And the final type of malware that I wanna to touch on is the nastiest of all, it's called ransomware and it's currently the number one threat that's out there in the wild. It's a malware designed to encrypt files on a system, making them inaccessible, and then the hacker demands a ransom to decrypt them, hence the name ransomware. Ransomware could infect the system in the form of Trojan horse or a worm. So ransomware is a broader category that actually encrypts files, but a ransomware could also include a Trojan horse or a worm. Now, whoa, what happened to our machine here? Relax, guys. This is just a screenshot. This is what happens when you get hit by ransomware. In this case, somebody's website has been hit with a ransomware. It says, oops, your website have been encrypted. And it says, these are all the files that have been encrypted. It says to recover them. You can certainly do so, but you must pay. And then it's, it shows you how you pay. And there's also a little timer to the left, as you can see. Typically, they give you 24 hours or 48 hours, or there's some sort of sense of urgency attached to this threat. And basically, they're, they're holding your machine hostage. And if you don't get back to them, then all of your files get deleted. And here they're asking for a payment to be made in Bitcoin. Typically, that's how they would want you to pay in a form of Bitcoin because it's hard to trace. Like if you sent money with a credit card or through a bank transaction, it can be tracked. But with Bitcoin, it's a lot harder to track. Now let's look at security threats from a bit of a different angle, human vulnerabilities. So as you can see in the picture here, you have an average looking guy who could be a super villain. You just never know. So the first type that I want to talk about, and it's a very sophisticated type of attack, guys, it's called social engineering. Hackers use social skills with malicious intent to steal information. An example could be a cyber criminal pretending to be an IT help desk. So for example, if you have ever worked in a help desk environment, you know how help desk works. And let's say if you're a bad guy, you can call some random company XYZ and pretend to be an IT guy and use sophisticated IT help desk lingo 
and fool that person into believing that you're indeed an IT guy and they may give you their username and password and then you can use that information to break into their machine or their account and then compromise their machine and wreak havoc within that network. The other type of attack that falls under the umbrella of social engineering is called phishing attack. It's a fraudulent message, typically in a form of email, social media message, a text message or a call sent pretending to be from a legitimate business to trick a victim into revealing sensitive information. An example could be email demanding immediate IRS payment. So typically during tax season, March through April timeframe, you'll see that there's this increase in these type of attacks where these bad actors on the internet start sending these demand notices pretending to be IRS and they go, if you don't make a payment to IRS, here's the amount of money you owe in taxes. If you don't pay this within the next 24 hours, you will have FBI busting through your front door and they put a fear of God in your heart. And for people that are not familiar with this and that are not very security centric, they may freak out and they may end up paying the bad guy. There's another attack called dictionary attack or a brute force attack. Now this is a type of attack where a relentless attack is launched to find victims password. An example here could be a dictionary attack tool used for guessing password. So for example, if your password is baseball123, this is a perfect candidate for a dictionary attack because it's a dictionary word and then the numbers are very straightforward, one, two, three. If you had a strong enough machine that had really strong horsepower, you can use a dictionary attack tool to be able to guess that password in a matter of minutes. And another type of attack is called a physical security attack. And that's a type of attack used to break into a physical location using human vulnerability or a physical parameter flaw. So for example, someone pretending to be an employee and let's say you use your badge, electronic badge to get into your office and all of a sudden you see somebody rushing behind you and they might be carrying a box and they go, could you please open the door for me? I left my badge in the car and I'm here to just drop off this box and I'm gonna walk right out. You may allow them to go in. Now they took advantage of your human vulnerability, right? You didn't check their badge and they kind of pressured you into walking into your office because they were carrying a box and you felt like, oh my God, I don't want to inconvenience them and ask them for a form of identity. I'm just going to let them in. They gotcha. So these are some of the things you want to think about. And another big one, guys, is watch out for recently fired or disgruntled employees. If somebody is not happy at work and they're highly skilled, especially in the security department, or advanced networking skills, or if you fired somebody recently, you gotta watch out. They might launch an active attack and you need to have measures in place to protect yourself. So some of the things you can do is, as soon as an employee is terminated, make sure their access is immediately removed from the system. So make sure it's all automated. You don't need a lot of human intervention. The only human intervention required will be somebody in HR tagging that employee to be terminated. As soon as they tag that employee, Active Directory and all those backend systems automatically just go ahead and remove access for that employee from all the different systems that employee had access to. And according to the US federal agencies, FBI, CIA, NSA, most cyber attacks are launched from within the organization. So while we invest a lot of money and buying bigger and beefier firewalls and spending millions of dollars in protecting our organizations from an outside threat, you never know. The threat might actually be lurking within your four walls. And what you need to do is not only look for threats from outside, but also have a mechanism in place to look for threats on the inside of your organization. And with that, now let's shift our attention to security defense techniques. The first thing you want to do is develop a security policy. And the way to do that is you define security standards. You develop a policy for protecting companies' physical and IT assets. 
In most companies, a chief security officer or a chief information security officer, also known as CISO, is responsible for developing the security policy. So that's the most important step, guys. You need to make sure that you have a security policy developed. Then what you do is you take the next step, user awareness and training. That means you design a formal training program as part of your security policy to educate users on how to protect themselves against various threats that we talked about so far, like malware, social engineering, etc. Make security training and certification mandatory for all employees. Make that part of your HR onboarding plan, for example. And then the final step would be physical access control. So which could mean providing a security badge to employees. Limit access to various locations in your company, such as an office, data center, etc., by providing badge access to employees, contractors, and customers. Now, employees may have a lot of access to all the facilities in your environment. Contractors may only be limited to certain locations and customers may only be given temporary access while they're accessing or attending a meeting at your site, for example. And electronic badge access also provides an audit trail. So a big benefit of having a badge access is it leaves an audit trail. So when somebody walks into a building, when they sign in, when they sign out, you have all those details captured through an audit trail because the badge identifies who the user is and when they signed in and when they signed out. And if anything malicious happened in that time frame, then at least that audit trail helps you pinpoint if they did something bad while they were physically there on site. And finally, automate the access removal of a terminated employee. I cannot emphasize that enough. Like I said before, as soon as an employee is terminated, Make sure not only their access to different systems is removed and IT assets is removed, but also their access is removed to your locations. Because also remember, we hear in the news all the time, bad guys going out there, an active shooter type situation, right? It's absolutely horrific. It's nightmarish. And the best way to protect against that is make sure they don't have access to the office to begin with after they have been terminated. Now. Let's look at authentication mechanisms. So the most basic rudimentary form of authentication mechanism that's been around since 1980s is a password. So what you have is a combination of a username and password. Make sure you develop a robust password policy. When you design your security policy, password policy should be a subset of your security policy. And in that policy, you should dictate that you should have long passwords that change periodically, combination of upper and lowercase, alphanumeric and special characters. And promote and facilitate the use of a password manager within your organization. Personally, I use one password, but you could use Dashlane or LastPass. And the whole idea with the password manager, if you're not familiar with password manager, it's a little application that you run on your Mac or PC or phone. And it's literally a password manager, meaning it keeps tabs of all of your usernames and passwords for different websites and different systems that you have access to. And the software generates a password for you. You don't have to keep using the same password with maybe few difference in characters because if that password gets hacked, then people can get into and try the same password and different variations to break into different systems. With the password manager, on the other hand, each password could be completely unique. And you can make them, I have some passwords that are 30 digits long, 30 characters long password. I mean, that's an insanely strong password and I possibly couldn't do it. Like if, if I just sat down and tried to figure it out on my own, no way, Jose. So password manager is an absolute lifesaver and it's a worthwhile investment. You should do it at a personal level, but also as an organization, you should make that part of your security policy. And the next level to passwords, which has gained a lot of popularity over the past decade or so, is called multi-factor authentication. So for example, on your phone, before logging into Amazon or a website of your choice, 
you may have multi-factor authentication enabled where they send you a security code, as you can see on your screen here, and you plug in that code into that website before typing in your password so you can gain access. Now, the idea is with multi-factor authentication, you have multiple pieces of information that you need to gain access to the system or a website. And another example that I can give you is piece one could be an ATM bank card. So bank gives you an ATM card, for example. So this is something you have. And piece number two could be the PIN number that you choose after you get your ATM card. This is something you know. So when you go to get cash from your bank, you'll go to the ATM machine, you'll put in your bank card, and after you put in the ATM card, it asks for a PIN code. You type in the PIN code and you're in. You can get cash, you can run different type of transactions. That's a form of multi-factor authentication. And the most common example is the one I gave you earlier, where you're logging into a website and they give you a security code because you gave them your phone number. Now, one thing to keep in mind with multi-factor authentication is unless you provide both pieces of information information, you cannot get in. You must provide both pieces of information. It's also referred to as two-factor authentication or 2FA. Now, two-factor authentication means you only have two pieces of information required. Now, in the example of an ATM card, you have a physical card and then you have a pen. That's two-factor authentication. But multi-factor authentication takes it to the next level. You may need additional pieces of information as well beyond just two to be able to gain access. And what you should do is make multi-factor authentication part of your security policy to promote a strong security posture within your organization. The third type of authentication mechanism is digital certificates. Digital certificates are analogous to a driver's license. And as you can see here on this picture that I have on the screen, a driver's license uniquely identifies an individual that has this license. So you may have multiple people with the same name, but they're completely unique based on different attributes, their date of birth, where they live, the color of their hair, their eyes, all that jazz. That collectively together uniquely identifies that individual. Now, similarly, digital certificate is an alternative form of credential used for the verification of identity. So computer systems use digital certificates to verify the identity. So for example, if there's a digital certificate on a server, it's to make sure that it's a legitimate server not some rogue bad actors machine in our environment, but a legitimate server installed by our corporation. And digital certificate is issued by a trusted certificate authority and it leverages PKI or public key infrastructure. Now there's a lot there, so let me unpack one by one. First, trusted certificate authority. It could be either an internal certificate authority within our corporation, but most likely if it's a public facing website, for example, let's say apple.com, you'll actually need a third party trusted certificate authority, somebody like VeriSign. You can look them up on the internet. They actually publish digital certificates. So when you go to apple.com, and you see a padlock in your browser, you can click on it and you'll see that there's actually a digital certificate issued by VeriSign to apple.com. And there's a whole process that takes place using PKI, which is a public key infrastructure. And PKI uses asymmetric key encryption. And when I say asymmetric, that means it's a combination of public and private key. And most of the browsers are programmed with the trusted third-party certificate authority information to begin with. So that helps me identify that it's coming from a legitimate third-party certificate authority server. And then because I trust that, I also trust apple.com. It's a whole chain of trust system at the end of the day. And without getting into too much detail, at a CCNP level, we're gonna go deep into this topic, but I'm just trying to keep it high level, trying to 
help you understand the concept here. Digital certificates are time sensitive and they can also be revoked. So you may have noticed if you have a corporate laptop, you have a certificate installed on it. Servers have certificates installed on them and there is an expiration date. Typically around five years is an average from what I've seen. Some companies are more aggressive. You may see three years lifetime for a certificate. It just depends on your corporate security policy. And what you also have is the ability to revoke a digital certificate. So for example, if a corporate laptop is lost, an administrator can go ahead and revoke the certificate that was issued to that user on that machine. So if somebody tries to break into the company using a stolen laptop, a digital certificate is no longer trusted. Digital certificates are tough to manage but provide very strong security. And the final type of authentication mechanism that I wanna to touch base on today is biometric security. So when I say biometric, different things probably come to your mind, but here we have a finger scanner. So we go ahead and put our finger on this finger scanner and if our fingerprint matches, we are granted access to either a facility or to a system. It's a form of authentication that relies on users' biological attributes for providing access. So once again, things like fingerprint, face recognition, iris recognition, voice recognition, even weight. So where weight comes in handy is, let's say it's a very secure data center type facility and it's a multi-floor data center. So as somebody gets into an elevator and they're trying to get to the next floor, there could be a mechanism in place that checks that person's weight. And it has a certain threshold. Let's say if you're 165 pounds, what it looks at is if your weight dramatically changed, if you went from 165 to 265, that ain't right, it, it's gonna refuse access. And there are many other examples, but this is just a subset of what biometric security can do. Now the thing about biometric security is this is the ultimate form of security. Now I'm gonna admit it's not perfect. There is no such thing as perfect security, but it's pretty close to being perfect because every single human being is unique and all of our biological attributes make us super unique. However, the big thing is it can be very expensive to implement as a physical security mechanism. If you have thousands of sites and you have biometric security deployed everywhere, just the management of that system and maintenance of these biometric scanners and getting all of your employees in the database, all that, that entire system could be very complicated and very expensive to maintain. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't touch on one of the key concepts when it comes to a defense mechanism called defense in depth. It's a very, very deep topic. I'm not going to spend a ton of time and this is once again, I'm kind of going beyond a typical CCNA exam, but I'm trying to give you a glimpse of what it takes to implement security from a real world perspective, because this topic is very near and dear to my heart. It's all about deploying security in layers. So we have a parameter layer. So this is the edge of our network. This is one layer where you would deploy certain type of security. Typically firewalls fit into the parameter security. Within the network, making our routers and switches hardened, it's called device hardening. You might actually do that at this layer within our defense in depth strategy. Then when it comes to the host, this could be a server and it could be antivirus, anti-malware protection, things like that, right? To protect the host or the server itself. Then that server might be running an application. Now, how do we protect that application? Once again, we could use things like antivirus, anti-malware, different type of mechanisms to protect that application. And then a level deeper is the gold mine, right? Data is the gold mine in our network. This is what the bad guys are after, ultimately. For example, if you're Tesla and you build this beautiful electric car, 
you wouldn't want your intellectual property and secret research and development data to be stolen by a bad guy because all of a sudden that data can now be used by a competitor to maybe start a brand new company that is now competing with Tesla at a much better price point. So what you can see here is security is not as simple as going, okay, I'm just gonna go ahead and buy a bunch of firewalls and it's like one and done type deal. It's never one and done. You wanna peel the onion. You always wanna look at security from different layers perspective and then you have to protect each layer uniquely within your environment to be able to ensure security. Now, once again, even with all these advanced security mechanisms, you're still not gonna be able to achieve 100% security, but by deploying security at each layer uniquely, you're severely reducing the attack surface. Each of these circles here we're looking at, each layer within our environment presents a unique attack surface. And by deploying different security techniques, the idea is to reduce the attack surface. Remember, if the bad guy is adamant enough, eventually they're gonna break into your environment, no matter what you do. It doesn't matter how smart you are or how much money you have spent. Eventually they're gonna break in. But if you made it so much harder for them that it takes them months or potentially even years to break in, people wanna go after easy targets. They don't have that much time. And if you think about the world we live in today, everybody wants instant gratification. If they're gonna try and try and try and after a few days, they're gonna probably give up and move on to the other company. And that's the idea. You wanna make it so much harder for the bad guy to break into your network that they just go ahead and give up and move on to somebody else. Now let's shift our attention to AAA. What is AAA? Stands for authentication, authorization, and accounting. Very important concept in security. Authentication in AAA answers the question, who is the user? Authorization answers the question, what is the user allowed to do? And accounting answers the question, what did the user do? AAA is implemented via a centralized authentication server, such as Identity Services Engine or ICE. Here, let's look at a quick environment. We have a couple of users down at the bottom below, Bob, Jen, Dan, connected to a LAN switch. There's an ICE server also connected to the same switch. Then we have a LAN that has a router and another switch and a firewall. Now, to look at things from a AAA perspective, we use terms like clients, AAA server, resources, right? So these are the resources on our network that we wanna gain access to. Now, when it comes to AAA, there are two protocols that are the most popular in the industry. One is called Radius, the other one is called TACX Plus. Thanks for sticking around. By the way, there's a lot more to this video than what you have seen. In order to watch the entire video, you're gonna have to be a little patient because I'm working on designing an entire CCNA course. I'm gonna do an official launch in the next couple of months, but until then, I'm gonna keep putting little nuggets of the CCNA exam out there on my YouTube channel until the course is ready to be published. Hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, give me a thumbs up, hit subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video.